Okay. Plenary meeting of the General Assembly is called to order. Members of the General Assembly will recall the meeting of the General Assembly of the 29th of October 2014. Members also recall that under agenda number 28, the General Assembly held a specific meeting at Development of Gender Equality on 23rd February 2015. The General Assembly will take action on draft decision on uh, uh, the resolution 65-L58 on participating of civil society in advancement of women at uh, 66 uh, plenary, plenary session. May I take it that the General Assembly decides to adopt the draft resolution E slash 65 L 58. It is so decided. The assembly continues with a thematic debate and um, we have our next speaker uh, on the intervention from Irina Bokova, Director General, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organizations. Over to you, Mrs. Bokova. Thank you. Honorable Mr. President, the Secretary General, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. As the first woman to lead UNESCO, I am pleased that education and gender parity in education are firmly on the agenda of the UN. I am equally pleased that there is recognition that education needs need to be integrated into all areas of sustainable development. Without education and equal access to education for girls and boys, sustainable development cannot be achieved. To name just one example, we won't be able to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, the first of the Millennium Development Goals, if people lack the basic skills to increase their income and expand their employment opportunities. Only one year of schooling can increase a person's earning by 10% and keeping girls at school beyond primary school is the best possible investment in development. We know that increasing the education of adolescent girls and young women carries impact across generations. We know education is the best cure against trans transmission of HIV and AIDS from mother to child. We know it is, best, it is the best way to avert child marriage. We know if all women completed primary education, we could reduce by 70% the number of women dying in childbirth in sub-Saharan Africa. This would mean that we would save 100,000 lives every year. Some 6.1 million children under five die in poor countries every year. We know we could cut this by half if all women had secondary education. Education and eliminating gender parity in access to education is a global priority of my organization <coughs> and I have also made it my personal priority. Sadly, in 2015, 15 years after the eight Millennium Development Goals were formulated, poverty still has a woman's face. 781.2 million people around the world cannot read or write, and about two-thirds of them, or 64%, are women. For this reason, girls' and women's empowerment remains one of my top priorities. We must remember that development is not sustainable if it is unequal. We must also remember that gender equality means literacy. 
And we shouldn't forget that equality must start at the school benches. So it's vital to allow for access to education and culture. In this spirit, UNESCO, UN Women, the UN Population Fund and the World Bank have joined forces to create the program entitled Empowering Adolescent Girls and Young Women Through Education. Its aim is to introduce more coordination and collaboration into our joint efforts to close the gender gap in education and, as a direct consequence, to accelerate development. UNESCO holds detailed statistics on educational levels and standards on global level. Our statistics show that of the 57 million out-of-school primary children around the world, 31 million are girls, and the number is higher still for secondary school education. Similarly, two-thirds of 493 million of the world's adult illiterate population remain women. Dropping out of school early often leads to teenage pregnancy and forced marriage, poor reproductive health, exposure to infections and diseases, domestic violence, and a lifelong cycle of poverty. To counteract this, the joint program will be introduced gradually in 20 countries where the education gap is more critical, starting with Mali, Nepal, Niger, Pakistan, South Sudan and the United Republic of Tanzania. It will concentrate on four areas. First of all, we must concentrate on improving the quality of education. It's not simply necessary to provide education, it has to be of a certain standard. Secondly, we must strengthen the links between the health and education sectors. Thirdly, we should work towards improving our database of statistics on gender and education. And finally, we should harness the potential of information and communication technologies to improve the delivery of uh, educational standards and uh, thus um, contribute to lifelong learning and uh, enabling people to exercise their citizenship. Let's remember that all UN member states have pledged to meet the eight Millennium Development Goals by the year 2015. One of them, the second goal, states uh, that uh, all countries should achieve universal primary education by 2015. And goal three states that we should work towards promoting gender equality and empower women. A lot has been already achieved. Several million more girls are now in school compared with the year 2000. And girls' access to education has markedly improved in some countries, such as Bangladesh, Benin, and Nepal. There's some positive news from India, where we are approaching gender parity in terms of enrollment uh, in schools. Nevertheless, there's still more boys than girls attending school in many countries. Some 54% of the world's out-of-school children are girls. In many countries, girls are faced with barriers to education, ranging from negative attitudes to the burden of household work and distance to school. Special efforts, such as recruiting female teachers to support poor families, to making schools more girl-friendly are needed to redress the balance. Nevertheless, 
uh, our data held in the UNESCO database still demonstrates a persistent gender gap. Although young women aged 15 to 24 have made the strongest gains, three out of five young people lacking basic and writing skills are still young women. In some countries, youth literacy, literacy rates for young women have remained persistently low, which results uh, a continued exclusion from education. Afghanistan is uh, such an example. But talking up about Afghanistan, we should um, still stress some very positive developments. We, there's a steady increase of female students since 2009. In fact, uh, 600,000 small female students have enrolled at schools. Also, uh, 12,500 teachers have been trained across 18 provinces. Um, so there are some very positive uh, developments. And um, in my concluding remarks, um, I would like to, to demonstrate and illustrate a little bit more what it actually means if uh, literacy is promoted and women are empowered through access to education. Using the example of, of Afghanistan, providing even basic literacy and numeracy training means that students can now do such simple things as write their own names. They can sign papers with the first name and, and, and surname, which they couldn't do before. They can also swap phone numbers with their friends because they know how to write down numbers. In terms of, of uh, managing the household, they can calculate how much they've spent at the local market. And uh, they can also just walking down the street, they can read signs and billboards on the street. When shopping, they can uh, write down measurements. They no longer have to be inventive and, and measure, let's say, cloth using their arms. They can actually <laughs> recognize numbers, write down numbers, and complete their purchases. They can also find their way around because they can read the address of, uh, of the place they're looking for. So even achieving very basic literacy and numeracy can change lives. So therefore, access to primary education should remain a very important goal in the time uh, from 2015 when we will start formulating our post-2015 uh, Millennium Development Goals. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Bokova, for your global perspective which you gave in your presentation. I think that was good and uh, I'm very pleased that you gave examples. Um, and I think it was very interesting for the delegates who are present today at our session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the uh, distinguished speakers, can I address you, asking you to speak to, your, to the time you are given for your presentation, please. Uh, we move on to the next speaker, um, and this is Gita Brown Gupta from the United Nations Children's Center. Over to you, please. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you very much for uh, giving this uh, floor today. Um, it's a privilege to be with you, um, and uh, I would like to talk about uh, gender equality and education. Um, India's huge stride in child survival um, offer proof that we are building momentum around our shared goal and of ending child deaths that can be prevented. This has been uh, formulated by uh, my colleagues uh, who spoke earlier today. Uh, let me give you some facts and figures. In 1990, when the global under five mortality rate was 88 per 1,000 live births, India's child mortality rate 
stood at 118 deaths per thousand live births. By 2010, India's under five mortality rate had fallen to 59 deaths per 1,000 live births, nearing the global average of 57. The recent advances in child survival are attributed to sustained political commitment and high impact interventions in public health, in nutrition, water, and sanitation, but also HIV and AIDS. Through scientific innovations and medical advances, we have developed and distributed life-saving commodities such as vaccines and disposable syringe and syringes. These, medi these medicines and supplies, uh, most of which are extremely simple and affordable, have enabled us to declare victory in our battle against some of the leading causes of preventable deaths. Now let me speak about some important victories. Uh, these include the eradication of polio in India. Each victory is a poignant reminder that we have the science, the technology and the know-how to keep women and children from dying uh, from causes that uh, we can easily treat and prevent. Yet, 1.58 million Indian children continue to die each year, and 56,000 mothers die from causes related to pregnancy. I will share another alarming statistic with you. In India, more than 50% of adolescent girls are not completing secondary education. This was mentioned by my colleagues earlier today who gave some statistics. Um, today, I want to also focus on the relationship uh, among all these terrifying figures and statistics. Among the 1.58 million children who die before their fifth birthday, almost one-third of deaths are due to infections, and nearly all of them can be prevented. Most of these children are born to mothers with little or no education, living in the poorest, most disadvantaged communities throughout India. My own family history, which is uh, rooted in India, is a testament to the power of maternal education. My paternal grandmother, who was called Bhagirati, married at age 11 or even 12, before she completed her schooling. Her new husband, who was an educated man and a nice man, earned um, a living working for a local government printing press. Over the span of 20 years, my, mater my paternal grandmother gave birth to 11 infants. Only six uh, of them survived. Because of the strain of these multiple pregnancies, um, Bagirati died at age 33. She left behind her six children, the eldest of whom died at age 14 because he contracted tuberculosis and he also cared for his mother. Um, so this um, account 
um, shows that um, it is um, there is gender inequality and um, in families modest as modest as uh, my ancestors um, girls are forced to marry very young. My grandmother was denied the opportunity to receive the education that might have equipped her with the information she needed to recognize that she needed to do something um, with um, the way she was uh, leading her life and having children. Today, in the 21st century, complications linked to pregnancies and childbirth claim the lives of more than 360,000 women. More than often, these women are denied the opportunity to have a formal education and to go to school, like my grandmother. The correlation between women's education and child mortality holds true across regions. The lower the level of a mother's education, the less favorable are the child's chances of survival. Thankfully, the converse is also true. The higher the level of a mother's education, the better equipped she is to recognize and pursue opportunities to give her child the best form of education. Now let's talk briefly about adolescence. Adolescence um, is the period ranging from 10 to 19 is uh, critical to the development of boys and girls. It is a period of growth and maturation, a phase when attitudes and behaviors are shaped. The possibilities uh, to make irre irreversible changes as well. The challenges that girls encounter in adolescence are particularly complex a recent UNICEF study shows that while the differences between boys and girls are relatively modest early in life, they increase expon exponentially, exponentially sorry, in adolescence. The future generations of women will be less likely to marry or have children while they themselves are, have children, like we've seen with my paternal grandmother. And the new generations will be better um, able to protect themselves from HIV and, hate, and AIDS. To make the most of these investments, we need to create and enable environments for girls' education using policies and programs to address these social barriers. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, as a society, we need to overturn harmful attitudes and behaviors. And we need to give a chance to girls and allow them to have an education. Thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, Mrs. Upton. Thank you for your intervention. Um, because we, so we have just 10 minutes before we have to finish the session. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Hillary Clinton today, our former U.S. Secretary of State. Over to you. Thank you. It is a privilege to be here today, especially since I get to talk about something that is very close to my own heart, and that is gender equality in education. Speaking from my own history, I know how important education can be for the future success and career of a child. I would not be sitting before you today had my mother, a woman who had only received a high school education, not instilled in me from a young age the importance of learning. 
She wanted to make sure that all of her children had the opportunities in life that she never did. And education was key in that goal. It is because of my mother's belief that her daughter and son should all get a good education that I went to attend Wesley College and also Yale Law School. Without education, I never would have become a lawyer, the first woman senator from New York, a presidential candidate, or secretary of state. And I would not be sitting in front of you today. Education gives children an ability to change their lives and their worlds. Discrimination in educational opportunities based on the gender of an individual should have no place in the 21st century. Boys and girls, regardless of race, nationality, or sexual orientation, should all be given access to quality education. Despite the many strides we have made, unfortunately, this goal still remains elusive. In countries around the world, women and girls especially are denied access to basic <coughs> education, whether through war, early marriage, family situation, or government policy. But this doesn't mean that we should give up or stop pushing for progress. America understands this, and the Obama administration is committed to furthering the rights of all women to a decent education. In 2011, while I was serving as Secretary of State, we set up the U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, with the goal to embed advances in gender equality and women's empowerment in the State Department policy throughout the world. It was and still is our belief that equal educational opportunities lead to more stable, more secure, and more democratic societies. And people like our amazing ambassador at large for global women's issues, Catherine Russell, and Secretary of State John Kerry have made sure that the State Department continues its efforts in supporting equal education for women and girls around the world. The U.S. has done this through teaming up with NGOs like Room to Read to provide secondary education for over 12,000 girls from Nepal, India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. In 2012, America and 12 other founding nations came together to launch the Equal Futures Partnership, an initiative which brought together states, NGOs, and the private sector to help advance women's education and participation in science, technology, engineering, math, and civic engagement. And in 13 countries in West Africa, the U.S. Agency for International Development is currently working to provide education and support to girls through their Ambassador Girls Scholarship Program, an initiative which ensures the continued education of girls through providing scholarships, mentoring, parent and community awareness programs to promote and support girls' education, and HIV and AIDS awareness activities to prevent and mitigate the spread of HIV and AIDS. The Ambassador Girls Scholarship Program also addresses the constraints to girls' participation, retention, and achievement at school. These constraints include financial and opportunity costs, socioeconomical factors, such as early marriage, as well as the devastating impact of HIV and AIDS on girls and their families. In too many regions around the world, not just West Africa, girls are denied access to school through geographical boundaries, cultural attitudes and expectations, economic circumstances, religious beliefs, and political and legal laxity. <laughs> As an international community, we need to make sure initiatives are put in place to break down these barriers and ensure educational access to girls from a young age, regardless of family circumstances or location. We need to help support brave individuals like Malala, who after her attempted assassination by the Taliban, instead of sitting down and shutting up about the needs for equal education for girls, is a vocal, determined, and empowered as ever to make sure girls all over the world have access to learning. The State Department, in conjunction with the Obama administration, has a firm belief that violence and extremism are best combated through the empowerment and, above all, the education of women and girls within communities. Extremists of all religions, 
systematically use a lack of education to their advantage in controlling people and communities. As we can see in the case of Malala, the thing religious extremists fear most is an 11-year-old child demanding the right to learn. Equal education, equal opportunities for all is the right thing to do, and it is a smart thing to do. That's why America has set up US exchange programs like Tech Girls, which provide opportunities to girls from the Middle East and West Africa to get hands-on training in science and technology while visiting the US. But there's so much more that we can do together. Take the story of Fatma, for example. Before she was nominated for the Tech Girls Project, she had never ventured outside her home country of Yemen. Now, as Fatma says, Yemen is a country where women and girls can often be seen as powerless. Tech Girls made Fatma realize her own creative and educational potential. Learning empowered her because education opens up ways of thinking and looking at the world that we may never have thought of before. It builds a better life and through it a better world for all people, not just women. And this is the message I would like you to come away with today. Gender equality in education is essential because through it we have the ability to change the world dynamic and to form understandings and build bridges between communities. As Fatma says, Tech Girls started as a normal educational exchange program, but it ended with so much more. It inspired 25 girls from eight different countries to become future leaders in their communities and the world at large. We need to ensure that there are more stories like Fatma's. And in order to do this, we must ensure gender equality in education throughout the world. Thank you. Linton, thank you very much for your intervention. It was very interesting, and uh, I'm sure the delegates have lots of questions, and we promised them to, that we will have questions today, but I don't see how we can do this, uh, because uh, we will have to start the new session in an hour. So uh, may I... Um, I'll close this morning meeting and we will resume our work at um, 1.32 something? Yeah, 2.30. Thank you.